सेव किया था ना मैं सिर्फ इसलिए गया था क्योंकि उसने मुझे कॉल किया दैट्स इट बट लिसन तो सेव इट फॉर समवन एल्स जिंदगी में सेव करना जरूरी है मगर जब बात पैसों की हो सिर्फ सेविंग से काम नहीं चलेगा इक्विटी म्यूचुअल फंड्स में इन्वेस्ट कीजिए और अपने सेविंग्स को आगे बढ़ने का मौका दीजिए म्यूचुअल फंड इन्वेस्टमेंट्स आर सब्जेक्ट टू मार्केट रिस्क रीड ऑल स्कीम रिलेटेड डॉक्यूमेंट्स केयरफुली वेन वॉज द लास्ट टाइम यू रोट अक और डिपोजिटेड वन रोन स्लिप और ब्लैंक क्लर्क फंड कब आएगा How simple was it to get your COVID vaccination through COVID, or even your passport using your Aadhaar authentication? What about DBT, the LPG subsidy many of us get in our bank accounts directly? A quiet digital transformation has been underway in the country over the last decade or so, which has made all of these things and more possible. And I'm not even talking about Swiggy, Zomato, Dunzo, Amazon, Flipkart, and whatnot. it's called digitalization and it's only expected to get better last week imf md kristalina georgieva said in an interview that india's digital infrastructure is its biggest advantage india gained from right targeting and digitalization after covid in india there was less support in the hands of people but it was well targeted because of digitalization India built an incredibly agile foundation for a time of shock through digital ID and digital public infrastructure. That is the biggest advantage India had at the outset of COVID. I hope that during the G20 presidency all the countries take this page from the Indian book for themselves. When was the last time a global uh, name in economics politics diplomacy said that let g20 countries take a lesson from india's book hello and welcome to quartermaster a quarterly show with the one and only saurabh mukherjee that takes a big picture look at change and its impact on the economy today we will talk about what digitalization is doing to the indian economy or how india's methodical build of digital assets creates competitive advantages Hi Sora welcome back uh, so when was the last time you wrote a check or signed one uh, sora I think it's been it's been three or four months, but uh, I think I love the way you introduce the whole thing. I think a career in screenplay awaits you in the dramatic visual way you explained the whole. Oh thing. man! No, I wish. Uh, I mean, that comes true because just a uh, couple of weeks back we published a, a piece uh, on how doctors, engineers, MBAs are all coming to Mumbai and becoming uh, scriptwriters for Netflix, Amazon. So, आपके मुँह में घी शक्कर as they would say. आपका time आएगा ना देश आपका time आएगा. <laughs> so, so this whole digitalization topic we are going to discuss today in Quarter Master. Uh, what is the reason you picked this topic? So, look, I think as you've already said, right? What's happened is very unusual. I've never seen any country uh, developed or developing build such an unusual set of assets over a ten, fifteen year period. Uh, america has given the world a whole bunch of digital assets but they are private assets right no country in the world has conceptualized digital commons in the way we have done and and this genuinely co- co- represents competitive advantage and in a way my reckoning is with the ondc round the corner with the launch of the open network for digital commerce round the corner i think the the world will recognize over the next 4 5 years how powerful a competitive advantage india's digital ecosystem has become i also wanted you know us to basically pay tribute to sort of thousands of people right who uh, over the last 15 years have worked their backsides flat to build these public assets right this is not private sector again people didn't people launching aadhar nandan elekani conceptualized it I, i suspect millions of people worked on the aadhar rollout uh, they didn't go home with esops uh, they didn't become unicorns but they laid the foundations of our digital ecosystem much like the people who got us independence did and similarly say upi right by far the world's largest real time payment system a system through which an astonishing 37% of india's gdp now gets transacted again the people uh, uh, from upi the people from mpci uh, didn't become unicorns didn't go home with esops 
but they deserve a tremendous amount of recognition. And now, as we speak, uh, ONDC is through, going through its pilot, and potentially ONDC transforms the economy one more time. This is transformation. ONDC does a third transformation. And last we heard, right, we didn't see an ONDC uh, a CEO, uh, a Koshi Saab, giving an interview about you know how much uh, the valuation of the company will be, right? So, so I think it's somewhere along the way we need to also pay tribute to people who transform our country, do so quietly, do so for very modest rewards, never seek the limelight, but make a dramatic impact on our lives. Absolutely. So uh, let us go back to the beginning, as you uh, talk about in your paper, uh, Saurabh, the trinity of jam, and it, it all started with Aadhaar, which uh, is about, say, 15 years, as you said. That's right. What difference has Aadhaar made? I think it's worth understanding sort of the difference of Aadhaar. To understand the difference of Aadhaar, it's worth going back into uh, Nandan Nilekani's thought process, right? In a way, Nandan is the architect of almost this entire journey. is architected by Nandan Nilekani. Num- numerous other people have applied their mental muscle and then their logistical firepower to make this work. But conceptualization came from Nandan. And I think Nandan's uh, big idea, which is contained in his book, uh, uh, Imagining India, his big idea was open access. So Nandan, I think... 15, 16 years ago, heard the Nobel Prize winning economist Douglas North say that, that countries which create open access, uh, countries which promote policies that facilitate access to markets, to institutions, to education, to, to healthcare, such countries, he called them open access societies, go on to prosper. Whereas in most countries, Douglas North rightly pointed out, in most countries, what happens is the elite, the elite makes sure that that the masses don't get access to capital, the access to education that they need, right? And this difference, Nanandan said, is fundamental to creating prosperity or robbing robbing a country of prosperity. And he decided that he would work on a bunch of things which would facilitate open access. And out of that idea, that abstract idea, okay, let's create open access, let's make India an open access society, an open access country. Out of that was born. Aadhaar, which was, as everybody knows, uh, addresses and biometrics for 1.2 billion people uh, that created the the basic platform in which all the good stuff you mentioned, right? UPI, Covin, your and my uh, uh, Swiggy Zomato deliveries, all of that, that's predicated on that basic Aadhaar platform. If the, the technical name, if you, when you go to Bangalore, they talk about the India stack. You know, not, me being not being a technical guy, when I first heard the Indian st- India stack from Nandar in 2013, it took me a while to understand how powerful it was. But on that foundation, and Aadhaar is a beautiful name, on that foundation, on that Aadhaar, we have constructed this ed- uh, digital edifice. And Aadhaar cre- uh, created the base for Jandhan, where um, after 2014, after the NDA came to power, uh, the Prime Minister said, let's create a construct. Let's create a construct where every Indian gets a bank account. 2014, I think shortly after the NDA's victory, Jandhan was launched. I have to confess, I was among the skeptics saying, how is it going to be possible to open so many bank accounts? I'm glad to say I was proved wrong. 440 million accounts have been opened on the Jandhan. Uh, by definition, many of these are, most of these are low-income people's accounts. And yet, and yet, 1.5 trillion rupees have been deposited by uh, people under the Jandhan construct. So, so it's a remarkable success. Jandhan itself, creation of 440 million accounts, uh, superimposed on Aadhaar, the Aadhaar, Aadhaar and the Jandhan bank account gets gets uh, seeded together. Uh, we also have to acknowledge the notable role played here by, by mobile and specifically okay. Geo. So 2016, uh, Geo went live with its uh, super cheap 4G offering, the lowest data prices seen for mobile data anywhere in the world. And that's how the, the, the Troika came together. Jandhan, uh, Aadhaar launched in 2010, Jandhan 2014, mobile 2016, mobile low cost, super low cost mobile became the via media through which Jan, Jandhan and Aadhaar spoke to each other. The Jandhan bank account spoke to Aadhaar through mobile. Um, and hey presto, you created an ecosystem through which during the two years of COVID, the Indian government delivered basically $300 billion of social security transfers. Right? Those salme, cumulatively, the government delivered $300 billion of social security transfer through this uh, construct. And uh, economists uh, writing uh, for the World Bank, uh, sorry, for the IMF, 
economists as notable as Sujeev Bhalla, uh, Arvind Virani, Karan Basin. They have done a bunch of research showing that had it not been for these transfers, $300 billion of transfers done through the COVID years, um, had it not been through the, for these transfers, we would have had far greater inequality, far more distress in the poorest strata of Indian society. So yes, the money helped, but the money wouldn't have reached the intended beneficiaries had this remarkable construct not existed. And in a way, jam came to India's rescue when India needed uh, jam the most, which was through those dire uh, two years of COVID. Uh, more generally, more generally, in a normal year, from what we can see, uh, YP, in a normal year, India is pumping around $70 billion through, through jam. This is going by our estimate to around 60 million families, which means a typical recipient family is getting $1,000 a year through the jam construct. These are obviously low income families and that thousand uh, dollars, say 80,000 rupees is the difference between, um, you know, life uh, on the below the poverty line and life above the poverty line. These same transfers in the old paradigm used to get leaked. The middleman would leach away a big chunk of the $70 billion, right? Uh, famously, Rajiv Gandhi said all the way back in 85, I remember I was in class uh, five then, I remember him saying that out of every 100 rupees the government spends, barely 15 rupees reaches the poor. And even though I was in class five, I thought, my God, that's a very dire situation. So so clearly we are, uh, the, uh, 40 years on, uh, the country is created a construct where the leakage is less, the poor benefit, and you are in my tax dollars. Uh, end up uh, uh, meaning meaning the difference between starvation and having food in the belly for millions of families. Sort of here, I have to make a disclosure uh, for the benefit of our viewers. Nandan is one of the investors in the print, uh, although that is not the reason we are doing this uh, show or having this uh, discussion. And I am also uh, very fortunate to have known and tracked Nandan from the late 90s in Infosys when I was covering uh, IT in uh, Bangalore uh, from the mid 90s onwards. And I have a you know particular anecdote uh, which uh, comes to mind, uh, which talks about how uh, how much Nandan evangelized tech even in those days. We didn't have smartphones, we didn't have mobile internet in those days, but there was something called WAP. Uh, I don't even know what that stands for today. Uh, and I had gone to the Infosys campus uh, to you know meet him, and uh, they had just opened a food court in the Infosys campus. So Nandan said, "Let's go have lunch in the food court." And you know, people stand in uh, line, and there was a Domino's, there was a South Indian outlet, there was a North Indian outlet, and all of that. So we stood in line, and uh, we wanted to know when our turn will come. And there was an option there to you know use your uh, phone and get your uh, number or something in the queue. I can't recall that. So Nandan said, let's just go and ask. I said, no, I'll, I'll check on my phone. He said, yeah, yeah, good, good. Use your phone. You should use your phone more. You should push that button and send it. I said, oh yeah, I will do it, Nandan. So, you know, it, it, it shows that how even from the late 90s, uh, Nandan had this thing for uh, uh, pushing technology uh, and evangelizing it for ordinary users. I mean, it's not SAAS or whatever those, uh, you know, geeky, uh, techy uh, abbreviations uh, we use. But this uh, movement from Aadhaar to Jandan to mobile, it now looks like it all happened very smoothly, uh, like a logical uh, progression. But uh, but do you think that was how it was conceived, uh, Saurabh? So I think there's two aspects to this whole vision, right? The, the, the public service, the Kind of national service vision I, I talked about, right? Nandan's vision of, of open access societies, right? That was very clear. I think the, the tech architecture, right? The fact that these systems are interoperable, they talk to each other through API, that it, it's a bit like a Lego, right? You're building layer after layer on top of it. Uh, uh, I think we got we to credit not just Nandan for that. Nandan obviously is a formidable tech brain. Uh, he's a formidable brain, full stop. But I think there's a whole bunch of people uh, from the Bangalore ecosystem. Um, so there's a whole bunch of people in iSpirit who I think have played a big role here. Uh, now there's people at the Beckon, at the Beckon Foundation, D-E-C-K-N, who are playing a big role in creating these Beckon protocols which underpin ONDC. So there's a whole bunch of people in Bangalore uh, who've played a critical role in in the in this remarkable tech construct and if you think about just go to the sort of most visceral level the comparative advantage of a country fundamentally are its people the fact that for 40 50 years we have created a, a well-educated hard-working middle class 
right? 100 million people roughly uh, educated to a high level, uh, committed to a life of work and, and thought. That's now bearing fruit for India. We are producing thinkers and doers of world class who are bringing to the fore uh, assets that the rest of the world haven't seen. So in different strata of life, different people are doing it, say Gopi Chandin in badminton or Rahul Dravid in cricket, but in the in the sort of uh, 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 digital and economic arena, uh, folks like Nandan, the team at iSpirit, the team at Beckon Foundation, these guys are doing cutting edge work, which has very little uh, by way of equal anywhere else in the world. And that ultimately is what will propel India to, to creating world-class world class, uh, uh, assets, creating comparative advantages. So while I was going through your uh, paper on uh, digitalization, uh, I noticed something uh, very significant. When we were talking about Jan, uh, Aadhaar is described as the world's largest, most ambitious and most national registry successful project. Later on, uh, we talk about uh, mobile access. India now uses more mobile data than any other country in the world. Uh, even later on, when we are talking about uh, UPI, uh, UPI has now become by a country mind the world's largest real-time electronic payment system. World's largest, world's most, world's biggest. I mean, uh, in, in something like this, uh, who would have thought even 15 years back, India would be talking about so many firsts or so many uh, number ones uh, in this kind of a arena? Yeah, so I think that's a good point you raised there. That's interesting for two reasons, right? One of the reasons these things have scaled so quickly is network effects are playing out beautifully, right? So almost all of these curves are exponential. So, uh, you know, uh, anybody who wants to can see the Aadhaar sign up curve, it goes exponential. If you go to the NPCI website and see the data on UPI transaction volume, almost every month it is going through the roof, right? So I remember uh, looking at that number four months ago, five months ago, India's annual transaction volume through UPI, it was around $600 billion. In four or five months, it's become $1.1 trillion, right? So, so because of network effects, because the more I use UPI, the more the vendors who service me use UPI. The more my uh, Akbar Wala, the Chai Ka Dukan outside our office uses UPI, the more their customers are compared to using UPI. So I'll give you an example. Uh, from 20 meters away from where we are sitting is the local uh, uh, Coffee Wala, Chai Wala outside our office. He set up his stall literally a year ago uh, after COVID. Initially he used to take cash, right? Then gradually as the COVID unlock happened, his business burgeoned. He now sells, I asked him, he says he sells 2,500 cups of chai or coffee a day. He does not take cash. He said, time in here boss, agar 10, 20 rupees dena hai, tum free mein pilo. Right? He says, here's the QR code, aap choose kar lo, Google Pay, Paytm, jo bhi karna hai, QR code. You, he trusts you to do the QR coding. He doesn't have time to take your chiller, give you some soil note to go to HDFC bank or ICICI bank. He says, this is what it is, QR code karna hai. Given the volumes he's doing, he simply doesn't have time to, to take cash. Right? Now, what the data is suggesting is 15% of Indian businesses now do this. Right? They almost exclusively rely for uh, on digital payments. And my Akbarwala, the guy, I, I still read the Akbar the old fashioned way. He comes and gives me the receipt like this. He doesn't even look up. He says, Google Pay Kar Dena and he walks away. He doesn't expect to be handed some note for fiddles in his pocket. Now, these are epic changes. At the SME level, we are turning black into white. We are turning cash into digital. Uh, uh, money is moving quicker. Right? That means the velocity of money has uh, has increased for a given amount of currency in the country. We will get more national income out of the country, which means economic growth naturally benefits. Right? These are remarkable changes for what is still a poor country. This digitization, which is driven ground up, there is no edict from above. There's nothing from the, the government which tells the uh, the stall, the coffee stall outside, you have to use digitally. He's saying commercial imperatives mean I will use digital. Interestingly, there's a Starbucks another 50 meters down, which is charging 250 rupees as opposed to 25. They are willing to accept cash, but the 25 rupees guy is the same time in here. Wow. And you threw a googly there, uh, sir. You call you use something called the Friedman version of the quantity theory of money equation. <laughs> that was completely like you know bold, you know, middle stuff. Can you tell us? Uh, Let's discuss it. Joe Milton Friedman is passed away now, but 
around 60 years ago he he came up with a very simple equation which captures the role of money in a modern economy right so if you're an economist listening i appreciate there are issues with the friedman equation but for understanding the impact of of digital money and of uh, of upi this is the simplest way to to understand the impact so what the friedman equation says is the amount of currency in a country let's call it m0 right the amount of money in a country uh, m multiplied by the velocity velocity is the number of times that currency note spins in a given year right so m times v right friedman says should equal your national income national income we describes as p price times y which is economic activity so mv is equal to py is is the friedman version of what's called the quantity theory of money right if m the amount of money in the economy is held constant but v goes up v is velocity v is the number of times a given 100 rupee note is spinning around if that 100 rupee note is spinning around faster and faster in digital format right because i am qr coding it to yp yp is qr coding it to his akbar wala who is qr coding it to his is uh, dud wala and so on right if that given amount of money is is spinning around quicker and quicker mv is gone up by definition as per the quantity theory of money national income has to go up if you hold price is constant economic activity has to go up right and in the if you think about it at a very simple level if money moves around quicker if my uh, my uh, coffee wala outside is getting paid quicker he has more cash in hand he can use that cash in hand to buy stocks in the stock market or he can use that cash in hand to set up another coffee stall 50 meters down the road right but economic activity steps up because a given amount of money is spinning around faster and faster and the simplest way therefore to understand the impact of upi becoming larger is is mv equal to py where velocity of money is stepping up now there's another reason why uh, uh, we keep discussing this rapid scaling up of things like aadhar like uh, jandhan aadhar mobile uh, uh, like uh, uh, upi uh, that's because we are just starting this journey abhi sirf pehle 10 saal hua hai within the first 10 years with smartphone penetration in india at around 40 45% we are hitting these stupendous numbers right the world's largest consumption of mobile data uh, the the by far the world's largest real time payment system just with 40 45% smartphone usage over the next decade as this 40 45 goes to 80 90 these numbers will absolutely go through the roof right the amount of money flowing through digitally the amount of data generated digitally will go through the roof and it's in that context that we will be able to turn our digital uh, networks upi aadhar uh, 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 the whole jam construct uh, we will be able to turn these networks into very powerful competitive assets for the country the next step you talk about after upi is ondc and ondc is still a new concept for those of us who don't know too much about ondc why is there so much excitement about ondc don't we have amazon and flipkart so sure. so look part of the excitement is obviously novel no other country has done something like this so so let's just understand what how ondc differs from the current paradigm mm-hmm. so current paradigm may you and i are using what's called what, what it's now called in sort of the bangalore com- com- community this is called monolithic tech platforms what is a monolithic tech platform uh, say uh, uh, yp wants to read say you know sorobs coffee can investing So YP goes to Amazon. He looks up coffee can investing. Amazon cites him a price. YP says, "Chalo, I will pay." YP clicks on the book. Amazon basically says, "YP, here's your here's a couple of payment options." Uh, YP chooses from them, and a um, couple of days later, uh, courtesy whichever courier Amazon is using, whichever delivery vendor Amazon is using, YP has the coffee can investing in his hand. Right. So that's called a monolithic platform uh, uh, because the end to end process. is all in the hands of one platform right why people have used flipkart rather than amazon but that too is another monolithic platform right what ondc is saying is the ondc is saying think of a brave new world where yp uh, says i want to read coffee can investing a whole plethora of vendors are available for him to choose from he can choose flipkart he can choose amazon he can choose crossword the local bookstore in khan market whatever he feels like so a plethora of sellers uh, line up for ip all vying for his custom competing uh, 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 competing intensely for his custom from the local bookstore through to uh, the giant that is amazon once ip is chosen the book he then gets a choice of payment platforms to choose right 
Google Pay, whatever, Paytm, Razorpay, his high street bank, right? He can choose from a variety of Paytm payment platforms. Once he's done that, he can choose from a variety of delivery agents, right? So there is Blue Dart, the DHL, delivery, whatever, right? So ONDC is saying the buyer and the seller don't have to be on the same platform. The payments guy can also be on a separate platform and the delivery dude can also be on a separate platform. So the unbundling of the entire ecosystem has taken place, right? And therefore, if you think about these two uh, these two alternative uh, models of e-commerce, the monolithic versus the unbundled ONDC wala paradigm, the advantages that the unbundled paradigm offers, right, are threefold. Firstly, on the monolithic platform, if you're a big brand, right, and as I, I as an author know what happens, if you're a big brand and you're writing for a big brand, the big brand gets pride of place on a monolithic platform for good reason, right? If I was running a monolithic platform, I too would give pride of place to the big brands. The smaller brands get get to the to the sidelines. Therefore, in an ONDC type construct, the smaller brand's disadvantage is reduced radically. Second challenge is as a customer on the monolithic platforms, the product is being bundled. The entire proposition for YP to buy Coffee Can Investing was bundled. If he went to one of the monolithic platforms, an ONDC will be unbundled. If it's unbundled, there'll be more competition for every element of what YP wants, right? Not just the book, but also the payment systems, also the logistics, and therefore potentially YP gets a better deal on the unbundled package. And thirdly, in the current monolithic platforms, for small businesses, there's a a really powerful lock-in. If a small business, right, leaves the platform, it loses all its customers and it loses all the ratings it would have accumulated over the years. And therefore, the small business is locked into the monolithic platform, right? Implicitly locked in, right? The monolithic platform, which obviously gives it a weak bargaining hand when it comes to negotiations between the vendor and the platform. ONDC potentially addresses that uh, challenge as well. And that's why uh, the view is that for a, for the, from the perspective of the consumer, and the perspective of the of the small small vendor, uh, this unbundled construct, which is going to be unique to India, uh, is the way forward rather than the monolithic platforms that the world has been accustomed to. And you say ONDC is a good thing for the economy. Why? So competition, right? The, the fundamentally, uh, so I, I started with Nandan's point of view that open access societies are a good thing. Right? Open access platforms are a good thing. Right? You create a paradigm where where competition uh, 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 is intensified, it's a good thing. Now, there's been several economists who have done plenty of work on this. This is one of the most uh, 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 widely written about topics in the last 20 years. As many of you know, Lina Khan in America, uh, uh, on behest of the American government, has launched a powerful, you know, sort of wide-ranging investigation on the potentially anti-competitive impacts of the large monolithic platforms here. But several people at the World Bank, uh, such as Mark Dutz and Aydin Hairi, Mark Dutz and Aydin Hairi have published a paper showing that the more competition, more effective competition you have, the more economic growth you have in a country. Right? In Oxford University, a, a famous economist called Stephen Nickel, he's written a book about how if you have a, a, a more, more number of firms competing for YP's custom or Saurabh's custom, the more number of firms you have, the lower the super normal profits that these com- companies can earn and the higher economic growth. Right? So it's simple. think about it in the simplest terms possible. More competition gives customers lower prices customers buy more at lower prices that generates higher economic growth. Uh, that's one of the most sort of simplest foundational uh, uh, concepts in economics. And it's been validated by plenty of research that the more competition you have, the more economic growth you get by unbundling the, the e-commerce construct, ONDC promises more competition and thus higher economic growth. I like the way you conclude uh, sort of, you always compare what's happening in India now with something that happened in another big uh, economy uh, at some other point in time. Last time we talked about India and Japan. Uh, this time you conclude by talking about uh, what happened in the US, the emergence and completion of railroad networks, and I'm quoting uh, your blog from 25th of June, uh, by the 1880s, the advent of the telegraph at the turn of the century, the arrival of the Model T Ford in 1908, and the creation of a tarmac road network by 1940 joined up an economy which until then was a cluster of rural and regional economies. And you're comparing it to India today. Is it a similar situation as the US was between 1870 and 1940? Massive improvements in transport and communication networks 
in the banking system, in the tax regime, and in the way social security benefits are dispensed have allowed enterprising companies to capitalize on these changes and create mouth-wateringly valuable franchises. And that's good for investors. How? So look, I mean, if you think about it, right, whether it's uh, uh, Marcellus as a as a local investor in local companies or the foreign investors who invest via Marcellus, what are people looking for? People are saying, uh, if I'm a global investor, I'm coming to India with say $500 million. I can't afford to have say more than 10 positions, maximum perhaps out of 15 positions. So I need, I need companies where I can buy stakes of 40, $50 million each. Now, what, not only do I want to buy stakes of 40, $50 million each in a dozen odd high quality companies. I want these stakes to grow over time. What is the simplest way I can get comfort in the in the ability of my of my investing companies to grow over time? So, uh, simple way number one: as we formalize the economy, as the coffee wall outside does less cash and more digital, then the black economy dies. Market share moves to the white economy. So several sectors of the Indian economy a decade back were 50 black and 50 white. They have become one third black and two thirds white. So I, as an investor, Marcellus's clients benefit because in paints, in pipes, in adhesives, in jewelry, in undergarments, the black is diminishing, the white is growing. Right. So that's my first path to to prosperity as an investor. Second. The economy itself grows at a healthy rate, 6-7% real, hopefully a little bit more than that. Why will the economy grow at a healthy rate? Because we are connecting the country up, right? If you take uh, 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 laborers from one part of the country where they are in surplus to another part of the country where they're in deficit, you are creating economic prosperity. If you take capital from people like us who have savings to companies who need the capital, you're creating prosperity, right? So by linking up the country, by joining uh, what was hitherto uh, a broken up, fragmented economy, by joining it, we are creating prosperity. That's the second layer of comfort to investors, whether they be foreign investors or, or local investors like Marcellus. So one is black going white. Second is linking up the country, taking economic resources from A and giving it to B because B needs it more than A. And the third aspect is if you create a, a growth paradigm, which is fundamentally equitable, right, where everybody can see that there is something in it for me. The coffee guy outside is a migrant from Telangana. He's a 23 year old kid, right, bright guy, right. He can see there is something in it for him. So his brother has also joined him. Right. Uh, 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 in Marcellus, many of the people who work in our ops team are people from very modest backgrounds. Uh, they have worked there. Their parents have worked bloody hard to get them a BCom degree and right? to get, have these kids get a BCom degree. These kids have joined Marcellus. Marcellus is a play on financialization. These families, these kids, these kids' families are now proud of the fact that they killed themselves to get their kids an education. The kids are doing well. If we can create through ONDC, through UPI, through Aadhaara Society, where the small business and the average Indian says there is something in it for me, right? It becomes evident to the foreign investor and to people like us that we are creating a growth story which will sustain rather than run out of steam because of the sorts of events say that are taking place in America, where a small group of super rich people are cornering uh, 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 inordinate amounts of the country's wealth. And as you must have read, the median American today actually lives uh, uh, has his lifespan is shorter today than it was 50 years ago. Uh, in a country like the UK, the bottom 20% of the UK population is significantly poorer today than the bottom 20% in Slovenia, right? So these inequitable outcomes, which are which are delegitimizing de the free market in the Western world, right? Hopefully won't come to pass here. We've had enough of that over the, over the 70 years of Indian independence. We now need to create paradigms which spread prosperity, which give everybody an equal say. So three different points of view at play. One is black going white, courtesy the uh, widespread of digital money. Secondly, the linking up of the country and the transference of resources from where they are surplus to where they are deficient. And thirdly, the spreading of prosperity to the small guy, to the small business, and thus a greater faith that the system delivers a reasonably fair deal for uh, more than the urban elite. So creating a growth story that will sustain is is, is the bottom line of uh, this whole process. And to quote uh, what you wrote in your paper uh, blog, uh, Saurabh, is that, you know, that is why the step-by-step -step construction of India's digital economy can over the next decade become a competitive advantage for the country. And we see that happening uh, right in front of us. I know uh, a lot of us talk about uh, privacy concerns, 
uh, a lot of us worry about uh, UPI ka fraud ho gaya. I pressed a code and my money got emptied and all of that. That can still happen uh, even without UPI. That can still happen uh, when you keep your money in a, a locker. Uh, that used to happen when banks were uh, looted. Uh, so uh, crime and privacy will remain issues and I'm sure they will be addressed. And I come back to what Nandan once said, uh, if you have a mobile phone, a smartphone, especially these days, there is no privacy. Whether you use UPI or not UPI, whether you use X uh, messaging service or Y messaging service, your mobile phone knows a lot. On that note, let me uh, conclude this, uh, yet another wonderful uh, episode of Quartermaster. Digitalization was the big theme. Thank you so much, uh, Saurabh, uh, for sparing your time. And uh, we will come back to you next quarter with another episode. Have Thanks, a Prit. Thanks, Prit. Thank you very much. Wonderful chatting with you, Saurabh. Bye for now. 